Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 10 um, for Jacksonian Democracy. And today we're going to be covering the periods 1820 to 1840 in this lecture. Um, we've got two big high points we're going to cover, um, and that's Andrew Jackson and changes in democracy. Um, and then number two is nullification and Indian removal. Uh, there we go. Um, so starting off with Andrew Jackson and changes in democracy. This is our boy, Andrew Jackson, right here. Uh, he's born in the backwoods of Carolina in 1767. He's a real country boy. He's also like on the frontier kind of at this time. Um, and he's going to eventually move up, you know, once he, as he gets older, uh, he and his family will move from the Carolinas to Tennessee. They'll continue to push west and west as the U.S. gets more territory. Um, and as he grows up, he'll eventually become a lawyer in Tennessee. Um, but he is a very... You know, you can take the man out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the man, right? So he continues to get drunk, square up with people at the bar. Um, and he will even go so far as to kill a man who insults his wife. Um, so really, really, really tough man there. Um, he will eventually um, buy slaves as he gets more and more money and wealth and land. Um, and then he will build a mansion called the Hermitage that's near Nashville that you can actually still go and tour to this day. Um, he is the first man, the first person. I don't know why it says man. <laughs> I wasn't thinking straight that day. The first person elected um, from Tennessee to the House of Representatives. Uh, and then he also served briefly in the Senate as a United States Senator for Tennessee. Uh, what he's most known for, besides being a president, is being the major general in the War of 1812 um, and becoming a national hero for defeating the British at New Orleans. That's why we have Jackson Square and a monument of ja uh, Andrew Jackson in New Orleans here. <clears throat> um, so he is a man um, that is completely elected by popular vote. He's the first president that really connects to the average American everyday person. Um, and so because of that, the citizens will really, really like him and really want him to be president um, more so than the other politicians really like him and want him to be president. So it's this real early divide um, for the first time that we see in America that somebody is like not part of the machine, but really like is liked by the citizens. Um, he is going to... Um, see himself as the direct representative of the common man and so he's not going to have any time for any real high political thought any like intrigue any like backdoor deals that's just not going to be his thing um he's going to be he sees himself as a common man as an everyday man um still from that backwoods in the carolinas um in the white house and so he'll bring that mentality forward with him through all of this um, in his first annual message to Congress, so his first um, State of the Union, essentially, um, he's actually going to recommend and call for eliminating the Electoral College, which is something that's in our Constitution. Um, and so even early on, we have this like pro-radical democracy um, angle from him here. Um, he's also going to try to democratize federal office holding. So this is um, that... Um, not politicians necessarily, but uh, workers, like the office workers, right? The secretaries, the people who are running the departments, the admin people. Um, he's going to want try out rotating them out of office. He thinks that they should also have term limits like politicians um, and that they, it, the jobs that they do should not be so intense and so, you know, crazy involved that you need one person in it for a long time between presidents and between politicians. So he's going to try that out. It's spoiler alert, not going to work out very well for him. And he'll go back to the way that things we're doing and which we currently have now. Um, but more than anything else, Jackson will be, <laughs> excuse me, Jackson will be a very polarizing fig figure in national politics. And so because of that, we're going to have two parties grow out of the old Republican party. Um, we're going to have the Democratic Republicans or the Democrats. That this When we eventually drop the Republican part of it and just keep the Democrat part of it, and that's the Democratic Party that we have um, to, today. Um, 
And then uh, they're going to follow Jackson. That's Jackson's party is the Democratic Republicans. And then the National Republicans or the Whigs are going to be against him. And so we'll have um, for a short period of time, we'll have three peri- uh, three political parties. We'll have the Whigs or the Democratic Republicans. And then we'll have Republicans um, all here, kind of really all stemming out of following one president or the other over their times. Um, he's also going to be widely regarded as King Andrew the I. Um, lots of people, especially politicians, are not going to like how involved he is with um, making and passing laws. He has no problem vetoing anything that he does not like. He has no problem making his own opinions known about what laws should be created and which ones shouldn't be. Um, He has no problem keeping his mouth shut when dealing with the senators and the uh, representatives. Um, And so people really start to, people who don't like him will really start to see himself or see them as, will really start to see him as a dictator and position themselves against him, right? And they'll start idealizing him and characterizing him as King Andrew the first. And two of the big people that do this are Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, who we'll see again when we get closer to the Civil War. Um, And so that's all going to come stem from that he doesn't defer to Congress in policymaking. Um, He doesn't just follow their lead. Uh, And that he's also going to have a huge party battle around the second bank of the united states he does not like the second bank of the united states he thinks it's corrupt he thinks it's not good it's not good for the common man um and so he will ultimately want to get rid of it um and he ultimately will rent win that fight um we the congress will put up a really good fight for him but ultimately they can't get around his veto veto when they um charter it the second time um moving on to nullification and indian removal Um, So nullification is this idea that the states don't have to follow what the federal government says, right? Um, Which is not really in the Constitution. It's actually the other way around in the Constitution, right? Uh, But we'll start from the top. I apologize for these bullet notes. I didn't realize that they were not formatted formatted to pop up. So um, starting at the top here, um, the tariff of abominations is going to be the nickname that's given to this particular tax that's placed on imported goods. Um, And it's passed in 1828 at the federal level, but immediately and even before it's passed, um, it is seen as something that's really heavily favoring the North, that this tariff is only good for Northern manufacturers and Southern agrarian people are not going to benefit from it at all. In fact, it'll actually hurt them um, is this idea Um, that comes out of this tariff, and that's why it's called, referred to as the Tariff of Abominations. Um, South Carolina, particularly, was undergoing uh, really bad times with growing um, during this time, and so they're especially worried that this high tariff, this high tax on foreign goods is going to damage the state's economy, and they're not going to be able to come back from it. And so during that year, 1828, we're seeing very large amounts of protest um, in the southern states, but especially in South Carolina, um, really protesting this tariff. They're calling it unconstitutional. And eventually, South Carolina will pass their ordinance of nullification, which will say that the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 um, are null and void and no law nor binding upon this state, its officers or citizens. They're going to say, we see that fed- that Congress passed a federal law and w- we ignore it we don't we don't agree with it we don't want it you can't make us follow it right um and it'll also forbid any appeal of any ordinance measure to the federal courts they're saying not only are we not going to follow it but you can't take us to the federal courts to make us follow it right um and it'll also go even a state a step further that will require all of the state office holders except for the ones that are in the federal um the federal Congress to take an oath of support for the ordinance. Um, And also they start threatening secession if the federal government tries to collect tariff duties by force. So South Carolina immediately is like, give me a reason. Give me a reason and I'm leaving. I'm leaving. We're not part of this country anymore. Um, And this is all the way back in 1832. Secession doesn't happen until 1861. So we've still got 30 years until secession. But even back then, South Carolina is ready to fight. They're ready to leave. 
over something like taxes here. Um, and they're codifying this into law and forcing, you know, their politicians, if you want to re represent this state, you have to agree to all of these ideas. So they're coming out really strong right out of the gate. Um, and what's going to happen is that it is a big crisis for the federal government. And Andrew Jackson is going to have no time, no patience for it. Um, he is going to see that um, ordinance of nullification as a direct threat to the federal union, um, especially with that threat to secede. Uh, and so he will submit to Congress a force bill um, that's going to authorize the use of federal troops to go to South Carolina and collect the tariff duties. And so in December of 1832, Jackson's going to issue his proclamation to the people of South Carolina, and he's going to say um, the federal government trumps anything that the state governments do, um, and that this union by armed force is treason. So if you try to leave this country by force, you will be considered tra uh, um, traitors to the country and will be handled that way. And again, we're dealing with this 30 years before we even really start seriously talking about secession for the Civil War. Um, South Carolina is not going to back down. Uh, so 10 days after that, they are going to, um, to give a response back. And they're going to say that each state of the union has the right, whenever it may deem such a course necessary, for the preservation of its liberties or vital interests to secede peace peaceably from the union, and that the South Carolina legislature regards with indignation the menaces which are directed against it and the concentration of a standing army on our borders, that the state will repel force by force and relying upon the blessings of God will min maintain its liberty at all hazards. So what does that mean? That's a lot of old, fancy, archaic words. Um, that means we're not backing down. And if you try to fight us, we will fight you back, right? They're saying that we read your letter. We see that what you're trying to do. You're trying to intimidate us, and we don't like it. And we're gonna, we're not gonna take it, right? We're not gonna just back down just because you have an army on our borders. We're gonna fight right back, right? We're not going down. We're not going down peacefully. And so there's really these threats back and forth happening. But uh, ultimately, in 1833, uh, on in March, Congress is gonna pass that fourth bill that that uh, Jackson asked for. So he's gonna ask Congress for it back in December of 1832, but they're not gonna actually take it up and pass it until a few months later. But in that meantime, um, Jackson does start mobilizing troops around South Carolina, just waiting for that fourth bill to be signed. Um, and so with that in 1833, South Carolina's isolation because of he's essentially kind of um, uh, blockaded them from reusing or interacting with a lot of other states. Um, and Jackson's determination to use military force, ultimately South Carolina will back down. Um, they'll back down in protest, but they'll ultimately back down from that nullification. And so they'll work on this this uh, modified tariff bill that's more acceptable to South Carolina um, that will also pass on the same date as the force bill. And so they'll um, respond 15 days later or 14 days later, uh, rescinding the ordinance of not nullification. And then three days later, also nullify the force bill. So it's this little petty drama that works out, right? Where you've got all this working and in Congress, they're trying to solve the situation. Jackson's like, just let me in there. Just let me in there and I'll raise the town and then they'll, they'll get on board real quick, right? Uh, so breaking that down again, what happens is that Congress passes Jackson's force bill that authorizes the use of force in, uh, in South Carolina. On the same day, they pass a modified tariff that South Carolina likes and agrees with. And so they both come down at the same time. So 14 days later, South Carolina is going to respond and say, okay, we agree with this tariff. We'll rescind that we, we take back our nullification on the first one. We're going to follow this tariff. We're good with this one. We're fine. So that's done and cleared, right? But you still got this force bill that's hanging out here that says that Jackson can use military force. And what does South Carolina do after they agree to the tariff and everything's good on this side? They nullify this bill and they say, actually, that force bill doesn't work here. You can't enter here. Um, just as like a little petty cherry on top, right? Um, this nullification crisis is going to make Jackson seem like a hero to the nationalists who really want this important, powerful federal government. Um, and he's going to really take that to the states, right? This idea that the national 
is stronger, the national is better. And so people who agree with him are really going to see this event as a shining moment for Jackson. Um, but it's going to make Southerners more conscious of their weakened position compared to the North um, and compared to the federal government, that as long as there's this Northern majority, the South could be in trouble. And so we start to get these rumors, these little cracks of problems in secession working throughout the states at this time. But again, we, we were still been building up to it, but we started to get some hints that hmm, maybe we're not as united as we think we are at this time. And then, of course, the other thing that Jackson is most known for is the Trail of Tears, the forced migration and removal of Native Americans from their ancestral lands. This is going to begin at the beginning of the 1830s, um, and over the whole scope of it, nearly 125,000 Native Americans um, lived in on millions of acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida. And so what's going to happen is that because we have white people who need homes and land and to settle, the federal government is going to force the Native Americans to leave their homelands and walk hundreds of miles to a specially designated Indian territory here across the Mississippi River. Now, if this Indian territory looks familiar to you, it should, because this is the current state of Oklahoma. This is not, if you've, if you've ever seen or read anything about Oklahoma, it's not full of Native Americans. So this promised Indian territory that won't be touched, we don't really keep up our end of the bargain there either. Um, white Americans, particularly those on the Western frontier, are going to fear and resent the Native Americans. And so uh, they're just going to see the American Indians as an unfamiliar people um, who are occupying land that white settler settlers wanted and believed that they deserved. So it's not just they wanted it, they believed that they deserved it more than the Native Americans did. Um, and some people, such as President George Washington, are even going to believe that the best way to solve this Indian problem was to simply civilize the Native Americans. And so the goal of the civilization campaign is to make Native Americans as much like white Americans as possible. Um, so we're going to encourage them to convert to Christianity, to learn to speak and read English, and to adopt European-style economic practices like individual ownership. We'll also... And, um, um, encourage and force them to adopt European style uh, clothing and attire as well and customs. And so in the southeastern United States, many Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, Creek, and Cherokee people embraced these customs. They, they just didn't fight it. They were like, all right, whatever, we'll go along with it for our preservation. Um, and these are going to become known as the five civilized tribes in America. And so many of these white citizens are going to want to, when they're looking for this land, are going to want to be making their fortunes with cotton because it's really, um, uh, really profitable at this time. And so they're going to, when the federal government can't or hasn't stepped in or Native Americans are refusing to leave, they're going to step in with violence to take these lands from their indigenous neighbors. They're going to steal livestock, burn and loot houses and towns, commit mass murder, and squat on land that does not belong to them. And so state governments will also join this effort um, to drive Native Americans out of the South. And several states will even pass laws limiting Native, Native American sovereignty and rights um, encroaching on their territory. So they'll cease to recognize Native American tribes as their own independent nations or civilizations and stop treating them that way. Jackson had long been an advocate of Indian removal, um, like pretty much since he was a child. Um, and as an army general, he spent years leading campaigns against the Creeks in Georgia and Alabama and the Seminoles in Florida um, that are going to result in the transfer of hundreds of thousands of acres of, of land from Indian nations to white farmers. So he's already kind of an old hand at it. He's very practiced. And as president, he's going to continue this. In 1830, he'll sign the Indian Removal Act, which will give the federal government the power to exchange native-held land in the Cotton Kingdom, east of the Mississippi River, for land to the west in the Indian colonization zone that the United States had acquired as part of the Louisiana Purchase. And so this will eventually become known as the Trail of Tears. It's over 5,043 miles long and covers nine states, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. And today, the Trail of Tears is a national historic trail, and it's run by the National Park Service. Um, and 
you can still cover parts of it. You can go walk it today um, by foot, horse, bicycle, or car. Um, so it's it's a really important part of our history that we sometimes only briefly talk about. Um, instead of choosing to live to work with the Native Americans, we just continue to change our promises and our contracts with them and then resort to violence or remo forcible removal um, to get our way for things. Um, so it's a really dark time in American history. Um, and so that'll bring us to the end of our uh, lecture here today on Andrew Jackson. Make sure to read the chapter for this week because it goes into a lot more detail about Jackson and a lot more detail about these uh, nullification and Indian removal here. Um, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or post it in our questions chat. And other than that, I'll see you back here for the next lecture.